Hello, everyone. Uh, hello, everyone. And I am Shazad, and I'm going to sort of uh, give an overview about perfect sampling. And it's more like an invitation. Uh, it's an area which is kind of classical, but has only recently seen revived interest. So I thought I'll start off with a concrete problem and then give some further directions and to give you a flavor of what this area is about. So let's take one very concrete problem, which we possibly all have encountered in some form of the other, that is graph culture. We are given a graph on n vertices and uh, of max degree delta, and we are given a set of colors k. We want to sample uniformly from the set of all proper colorings of this graph. So basically, a coloring in which two nodes don't get the same color. And the thing is that I want to emphasize the word exactly. I want to sample exactly according to the distribution path. And of course, we know this is an NP hard problem to even determine whether this set script C is NP or not, which is a set of all proper colorings. So we typically work in a regime where we know that things are easy, like K is greater than delta plus one. So we know greedy coloring will work. And a naive except reject sampling will not work because uh, it would take too long. And our goal is to find the minimum value of C, assuming that K is more than C times delta. Uh, to find the minimum value of C such that we can design efficient sampling algorithms from this uh, for this problem. Uh, so I'm going to sort of rush through the setup because I'm sure most of you are comfortable with it. Uh, so the chain sort of the method of choice here is to use this Markov chain called global dynamics, which is very popular. And it's a very simple chain, I'm sure all of you know it. But just to recall, it the way it the, works is the following: it takes a coloring chi and chooses a random vertex B, and then it sort of takes a random color, which is a legal color at P. So any color which is outside this set of block colors denoted by chi and B. So let's say it chooses the color yellow and it just assigns this random chosen color to the vertex V and that's how this update works. It's as simple as things can get. And of course, uh, typically the way this chain gets used is in the setting of approximate sampling where one Ask for a weaker demand, that is, we don't sample exactly according to pi, but close enough to pi in some total variation distance or some other. Norm. And uh, the way it works is you start with the coloring at zero and you keep on applying this chain repeatedly for a fixed amount of time. And in the end, you show by some method that this distribution at the end, xt, will be pretty close to pi. And one thing to note here is that. Uh, if you want the distance to come within epsilon, P usually scales as log one over epsilon. And the thing is, this is not quite enough for us because we want epsilon to be zero. So this won't uh, give you a perfect sample, right? Or it will make the algorithm infeasible. So one can ask, okay, why do we need to exactly sample if, uh, if we can do away with perfect sampling? Uh, well, firstly, I find this to be a very elegant and interesting question, right? It's kind of, uh, the, the methods we'll see here are some of the prettiest I have seen in whatever you can call the probabilistic toolbox. And uh, it also helps you design faster counting schemes uh, in, in some cases. And the other reason which is sort of more uh, practically motivated is that it provides, it provides you a stopping time criteria. So if you have some sampling task for which you have designed a Markov chain, you usually just run it for some time and hope that the sample you get is close enough to your distribution if you don't have mixing time guarantees, because there is no st stopping criteria that a Markov chain usually comes with, but these algorithms come with a stopping time criteria. So you might not be able to say how fast the algorithm will terminate, but the sample quality is never suspect. So that is an advantage. Uh, anyways, let me just give a comparison of approximate and exact sampling to tell you how well the two things match or how far apart they are, whichever way you look at it. So of course, there's a classical result of Jerome who showed that this global dynamics mixes fast when the number of colors is more than two times delta. 
And uh, then Google and I are sort of reproved it using the framework of path coupling. And there are lots of results which I'm skipping because uh, there's a huge body of work. But Vigoda in 2000 uh, had this breakthrough where he showed that uh, related dynamics called flip dynamics mixes at Iran by six delta. And it was improved further uh, very recently. But on the side of ex exact sampling or perfect sampling, not too much was known. The seminal result was of Huber, who came up with a very nice technology to even be able to perfectly sample. But you can see that the number of colors required are quadratic in delta. So there was a huge gap between the two regimes. And uh, then there was a big interlude. And in 2019, Feng, Gu, and Yin were able to improve this bound by some linear factor in delta for very restricted families of graphs. So the number of colors should not be more than log log n. That was their uh, setting. And then in a remarkable breakthrough, Liu Sinclair and Srivastava were able to give a deterministic approximate counter, uh, which matches almost Jerem's region. But the drawback was it was efficient only when delta was constant, only when for constant degree graphs. And in a work with Shayant and Chakrabarti is my colleague at TIFR, you are actually able to bring that quadratic bound down to a linear bound, three times delta, for general graphs. So, and in fact, this has been improved even further by another result of Jane, Shah, and Sony, which where this bound is morally now eight by three delta. And actually, yeah, now that I think of it, this uses this technique of preconditioning, which we sort of heard about in a couple of talks uh, before this one. And I sort of now want to, in the remaining five minutes, I want to give you a very quick flavor of what goes on in this exact sampling and why is it so much more difficult than approximate sampling, as if approximate sampling weren't difficult enough. So firstly, it's a fascinating question. If I give you a Markov chain P with a stationary distribution pi, can you do something using this Markov chain to get samples which are exactly distributed from pi? And there was a breakthrough work of Prop and Wilson uh, in 1996, but the ideas sort of date back all the way to 60s, to the 1960s, called coupling from the past. And if you haven't seen this, I highly encourage you to give it a look. It is, I'm sure it will put a smile on your face. It is pretty, it is pretty, pretty, yeah. So, so the idea here is very simple. It says that, okay, let's sort of jointly evolve a Markov chain from p equal to minus infinity to zero. And you can see the time indexes are now negative. So that's why that word past is there. And so you are running a Markov chain from each state. I will sort of get to it uh, in a little more detail on the next slide, but bear with me. So p, if that joint evolution rule is reasonable, you expect that by the time t equal to zero, all the chains would have coalesced to a unique state, omega star, and you just output omega star. That's the algorithm. Of course, now, the point is omega star is distributed exactly according to the distribution pi. That is the claim they prove. And the other thing is how do you run this algorithmically? Because you can't run it for so many steps. That doesn't make sense. So let's take an example of what they are trying to say, or rather let's try to understand better what they are trying to say. So they are generating these random updates, these random views, uh, such that each UI if you look at marginally, if you look at any state, like there I have highlighted the state omega to uh, the transition omega prime, it looks like the Markov chain P is being followed. That is the first requirement you need to satisfy. And then basically you want to find the first index, uh, like let's say minus T in this case, says that this composed function is a constant. Uh, and it should be clear that this is enough because if, if I know the image of U minus T composed all the way to U minus one is a constant, that is omega star, it doesn't matter what has happened previously in time. It's as if I found a shortcut to run all the minus infinity to zero steps. So this is the basic idea. Like, uh, let me sort of, in the interest of time, take a very quick example of how this would have worked. So in the U, so let's take a, a favorite example, which is a random walk on the line with uh, probability transition probabilities half each side and uh, a looping probability of half at the end. So then the CFTP would look something like this. These random updates are described by uh, a, a number between zero and one generated randomly. And if it is more than half, you sort of take a step upwards. And if it is less than half, you take a step backwards. And this is a joint uh, update for all these states 
uh, in our state space. So our state space is are the states of the chain. And you keep on evolving this, uh, this uh, random updates, you compose them until they become a constant function. So that is what the CFTP algorithm will look like. Of course, uh, I, I mean, it's very easy to generate a random sample from this distribution, but I wanted to sort of, yeah, okay, I have one minute, that's all I need. I wanted to sort of say what happens for the case of colorings. Why is it so much more difficult? So here is one natural way to implement our global dynamics in this setting of CFPP. Uh, you, you take these random updates to be given by a random permutation sigma minus one, sigma minus two, like these are all random permutations and a vertex where you want to apply the update, okay? And then how is this update interpreted? So you take a coloring chi and add the vertex V, you choose the first available color according to sigma. So like if your sigma I happens to be this permutation of colors and your vertex V i is V, then you can see that uh, the color red is sort of blocked for V because it's occupied by its neighbor, but the color yellow is free. And uh, that is how we will implement this update. Uh, this is basically taking the global dynamics and lifting it to the setting of CFTP. The problem here, which makes this challenge uh, sort of very interesting is that firstly, we need to understand how long in time will I have to go before this image becomes a constant function. And the second uh, problem is even if this were true, that is, you know, in polynomial time, I can ensure that this happens. How do I keep track of evolving so many chains? There are going to be exponentially many chains in the case of graph color. So these are the kind of challenges I, I mean, one has to deal with in this setting. And I will now sort of skip all this because I don't think have any time for this, but let's leave this up. And I just want to sort of uh, leave you with a few broad questions. Firstly, can we prove a JVV like this? Jerem, William, and Vazirani had this classical results about various notions of sampling and counting. But can we do something about relating approximate sampling with perfect sampling? Uh, and if not in generality, at least for restricted problems like spin systems. And more importantly, I want to understand, does it have benefits to other areas like uh, where, you know, there might be a lot of error or you might have to boost up approximate sampling and lose runtime because of that boost. Maybe at a similar runtime, you can actually get away if you use an exact sampling framework. Thank you. Thank you.